Thank you, Amy. Delightful introduction. Um, many familiar faces around the table. Hello to you all. Can't wait to come back and see you. If anybody is not sure, I'm the one with the red glasses, red hair, red face, whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is Jean-Nicolas next to me. Uh, somebody I've known from a long time. And one of the most astonishing uh, experiences in, in my tasting life was when a good friend of, of, of us and of uh, all of you there as well, Richard Orders, put on a vertical tasting of Richbourg in Burgundy. And uh, I'd been one of the people who, when Jean Nicolas first started making wine and showing it in the UK, I said these wines are a little bit too oaky, uh, and then the fruit's never really going to come through. And about halfway through this tasting, I had to go to Jean Nicolas and say, you were right and I was wrong, because the wines are magnificent. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to discover that uh, later on. Um, we're going to begin uh, with the three wines from Oregon. So Jean-Nicolas, say hello and tell us a little bit about the Oregon experiment. Yes, hello to everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, even if it's uh, far away. But uh, I think that's uh, a, a great opportunity, uh, nonetheless. Um, so yes, it's been um, an adventure since in the last uh, few years uh, in Oregon. I started this uh, venture with a good friend of mine, uh, Jay Goldberg, who uh, wanted uh, to uh, uh, make wine in his lifetime. And he, I guess he's discovered what uh, the reality is of making wine. And uh, 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 it's, uh, it's not always what you think. It's a lot of fun. Uh, most of the time, but it's not uh, always what you think. And yes, uh, last year we really suffered the hardship with uh, with the fires in Oregon that were even more uh, uh, impressive uh, than usual. Actually, Oregon had not suffered so so many fires before. It was mostly California, uh, but uh, in twenty it was bad enough that we had a a fog in uh, in the valley for uh, for a few days that um, really uh, damaged and tainted the grapes. But um, in eighteen, it was not like that. Um, and, and and perhaps um, and the presentation was a little bit pessimistic because I, I was in the, I was in Oregon during the summer of eighteen and it was very warm. And yes, there were a few, uh, a few fires, but very far away that um, uh, gave uh, 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 the region a little bit of a haze, I would say. Uh, normally, this is um, uh, the summer in, 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 uh, in Oregon is not like Eastern uh, America, where it's very humid and, and that there is a constant haze due to humidity. In the, so it's really crystal clear. And there was a little haze this time. You, if you had been in Shanghai, you would have said, "Well, it's pollution." Yes, it was. It was. It was pollution from the fires, but uh, uh, not really uh, anything that would uh, um, cover the sun or, or really had uh, an impact on uh, on grapes. And so, eighteen was really a uh, a great vintage in um, in Oregon with a season that was very dry, very sunny, um, very warm. Uh, fortunately, it cooled down in, um, in September with a, uh, 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 an episode of rainfall, a uh, significant episode of rainfall in uh, mid-September. And uh, when that happens in Oregon, you're always a bit afraid because uh, uh, it, it can resume uh, when it starts. Uh, normally, it doesn't rain during summer and uh, rain uh, resumes at the end of September, beginning of October. And normally when it starts, it doesn't stop. Uh, uh, and uh, the idea of course is to pick before uh, that happens. And so we're a little worried with, uh, with, uh, with 18 when it started to rain, but the vintage, uh, the weather uh, settled back into um, into great, uh, great weather and great sunshine, even an episode of heat. And this, that was treacherous because after uh, the cool down, really the, the vineyards were at the end of the cycle. And we began to see that really it, it, it started to, uh, the, the sugar levels started to uh, shoot up really quickly. And that was the pitfall of the 18 vintage in, in, in Oregon, a, a late harvest with 15% alcohol wines. 
uh, which was not the case with us. We had picked um, uh, almost everything before uh, we, uh, we uh, the, the, the sugars showed up. Actually, with these uh, wines, it's interesting regarding uh, this question because the first wine, I don't know exactly the order you've been having them, the Montazi would have been so first. So the Montazi was picked last and because this is a, a, a late ripening vi uh, vineyard and it was picked last and it would be the one with highest alcohol. I'm just checking, yes. they're all marked for 13 and a half. Yes, the, actually the Montazi is a bit higher. Uh, but um, uh, it's closer to 14 than 13 and a half. Whereas the others would be around 13 and a half, um, sometimes a bit lower uh, than this, but they're marked 13 and a half because of uh, European regulation. Uh, but there, I mean, it's true. I, I mean, we, we abide by these uh, regulations, but. Uh, Montazi would be the highest in alcohol, whereas Nisa, which is really um, the, the, the f one of the first we pick, and uh, followed by Bishop Creek, would be uh, would be a bit lower and would have been picked at the beginning of our uh, of our harvest uh, schedule. What is really the reason I really like the uh, 18 vintage in Oregon is uh, that we have a very good acidity um, and. Um, uh, I, I, I often say that, uh, which is less and less true, but I often say that uh, uh, ripening is always the issue in, uh, in Burgundy and acidity is always the issue in, uh, in, in Oregon. That was then. <laughs> that was then. That was then. That's true. That's ripening true. in Burgundy, much less of an issue uh, nowadays. Yes. I think that's a really interesting trio um, of three wines from the same winemaking team and uh, the same vintage and they're all from the Willamette Valley but from different subdivisions within. Um, so Nicola, do you want to say a little something about uh, how the winemaking works? If, does it differ from here? What your role is? Well it's, it's really the same canvas as here. We do uh, entire destemming, cold soap for a few days, so it's really the same, the same principles. Then, as I said, Oregon is always um, a, a little bit different in terms of uh, the reaction, the evolution in general. We see that the wines are evolving a bit quickly at uh, the beginning, uh, whereas the evolution in, in Burgundy, the élevage in, in the cellar is, is longer. But um, we've come to terms with this and we, uh, we, we, we know that um, the, the, these wines are bottled a little earlier than in Burgundy, but not much, where they need time in the barrels uh, also. So it's really the same, uh, the same principles. There's a little bit less new oak in, uh, in, in Oregon than in Burgundy. We, uh, I adapt to the local circumstances, but really the principles are, uh, are the same. And here you have three wines. So the, the, the strange names uh, are the names either of the owners or the, the, the names that the owners gave to, uh, to, to the site. And what is interesting is that we have three different vineyards here, three different AVAs, American Viticultural uh, Areas. So um, kind of Appellation Controlée for, uh, for America. And um, the first one, Montazi, is coming from McMinnville. A little bit of um, tightness here. McMinnville is, uh, yes, would be uh, something like, uh, I hate these comparisons with Burgundy, but for the sake of simplification, I would do it. It would be a little bit of Gervais Chambertin, Nisa, Dundee Hills. That's the Chambol Musigny of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Oregon. And, Mont and uh, Bishop Creek, uh, given the structure and the power of uh, the wine, I, I think it's more like Louis Saint Georges uh, in, um, in, in, in Ireland. What is interesting to know, and that will be my, I will finish with this and let you uh, perhaps uh, taste uh, and speak, uh, Jasper. What is in, in, an important piece of news I just received a few days ago is that. The uh, European Union just recognized uh, Willamette Valley as a uh, geographic name to be protected. So it granted the same kind of protection it, it has, uh, our Appellation Controle have in the European Union, and that was recognized for the Willamette Valley. 
uh, in America, and this is, there are only two regions in, in, in the US that benefit from this, Willamette Valley now and Napa Valley. So that tells you the, um, I think it's an important recognition in terms of the spirit of, uh, uh, of what is done there and uh, the achievement also. Uh, and uh, what they've done with the AVAs, it's not as strict as we, what we have here in Burgundy in terms of geographic delimitation and research and, 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 uh, and uh, defining uh, the, the, the wines and the region. That's very, uh, very pertinent, very, uh, very good job they've done, and they're, uh, they're getting there. I think that's really great exposition of everything that's going on. Uh, concentrated information coming your way. Um, it'll be good to have any feedback from you, but maybe I'll just give you my um, uh, first impressions. As soon as I put my nose into the Montazi, I thought that reminds me of when I first met Mayo Camusé Wines, whatever it is, best part of 30 years ago, um, when there is the, the vanilla side of oak is really quite prominent. Mm -hmm. And for my taste, at the moment I want to drink a wine, it's too prominent. But we now know with the experience that it's all going to fold in with the fruit. And it only has to be in your glass for a short amount of time. You can see the fruit coming up. It's not that the oak goes down, but it just gets covered and surrounded by the fruit. Um, so that was an extremely cheerful start. Um, the uh, Nisa uh, was, is to me, um, it's, the oak is much less apparent at the front. There's a little bit of a, a, a sort of toastiness maybe at the back. The wine is more concentrated at the back end of the palate. The acidity came through to me today a little bit higher. Um, that might be because there's more alcohol in the Montazi, which might cover it. Um, so I found the wines really quite different and not much to choose between them in, in my preferences. Um, and then I came to Bishop's Creek and I absolutely loved that wine right from the start. So that's my personal favorite of the three. Uh, there's a slightly darker color, there's a slightly darker fruit profile. There's clearly more concentration of fruit. And as a result, neither the oak nor the acidity are very prominent. Uh, so I think that's a terrifically balanced wine. And um, being, being English, I should wait five to 10 years before, before drinking it. Mm. But, uh, uh, and I know that actually that goes for most of you guys that you prefer your wines older rather than younger. But Jean-Nicolas is French, so who knows when he'll want to drink it. No, I, 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 I do uh, agree with uh, what you've been uh, most of uh, what you've been saying i generally i've learned to keep uh, bishop creek for a few years uh because this is a rather imposing wine i'm really pleased with the progress the wine has made over the last uh, year or so because it's it's not unapproachable uh i would say but this is really a wine benefiting from uh, uh, a few years of celery um, I've tasted uh, uh, not that long ago my last bottle of um, 14, which was a very uh, nice and easygoing vintage, and the wine was still, you know, a bit uh, very nice to drink, but a bit uh, imposing. What I'm um, um, seeing in terms of these wines, this, the, the drinkability of these wines, they seem to be progressing more linearly. Uh, that is, in, 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 with Burgundies, we have, you know, these kind of waves. Uh, they show great at some point, then they, 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 they close. You don't really know why, and then they, they come back. Uh, but but with, the, with, with the Aragon wines, uh, since 14, we've seen a, a kind of constant development, not really a moment when the wines were not approachable. But uh, clearly, uh, Bishop Creek benefiting from a few years. Uh, one comment about Montazi and the, the vanilla. It's it's true that I have uh, you know I'm I'm a bit immune to uh, to oak uh, now, so I, I don't get this uh, that um, uh, that hard. What happens though? One explanation of the uh, fruit profile and the, the aromatic profile of this first wine in Montazi is that we have a vineyard here which is um, done uh, biodynamically. Uh, the other two would be uh, would be uh, organic, but not biodynamic. Um, 
And I always find that there is a little bit of reduction, that there is a little bit of profile in that wine of richness, of exotic uh, um, side to that wine, which is perhaps the side. I told you this was a late ripening site, perhaps the site, but also perhaps viticulture here, uh, which uh, can explain this uh, this profile. And maybe yes, uh, and maybe perhaps we should decrease a little bit the, uh, the, the proportion of uh, new oak. At the same time, it can be a wine that can be a little tight, uh, light in the good uh, meaning of the word, but a little tight, so, you know, um, New York participates in opening the wine, so we'll see. Yes, let's let's uh, let's uh, look at the wine in a few uh, in a few years if we can. So we've had the 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 Oregon appetizer and very satisfying it, it was too. Is are there any questions from from the table in Daloyo before we move to Burgundy? Yeah, a couple quick questions. Um, you mentioned. Um, uh, Acidity, obviously, is uh, well. I guess historically, always easier to get in Burgundy. Lack the ripeness was the challenge. Ripeness becoming less of a challenge in the last few vintages, but in in Oregon, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, what have you found in the last few years? Has anything changed in terms of climate or cult, uh, viticulture in terms of Oregon that allows you to achieve better the acidity? Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything that has happened there, given how much the changes that you've been witnessing in Burgundy. Um, maybe that's the first question. The second question I was wondering is, are you able to irrigate these vineyards in Oregon? Because I, obviously in Burgundy you cannot, right? But I'm wondering whether you are able to do that there. Okay, in, um, in terms of climate change, yes, I can discuss this a little bit more easily with Burgundy because I, I've been in you know, making wine for 30 years. In Oregon, it's, it's just the beginning. Uh, what I'm uh, hearing is that really it's, it's, it's much warmer than it used to be there too. Um, it's true that 18 and 19, um, there, is, um, there is more acidity and the season has been uh, uh, cooler in Oregon than uh, the previous seasons. So is it a trend? I'm not sure. I think it's, it's just the way it is. This remains a cool region as is Burgundy and from time to time, even if the uh, climate uh, gets warmer, we'll still have these cold spell uh, and uh, these expressions of, uh, of, 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 of cool uh, wine regions. Uh, currently, 21 is a very warm uh, uh, season in, in, in Oregon and uh, uh, is scheduled to be very early uh, compared to uh, 18, which was more second half or even late September. So I'm not sure there is a pattern there. I'm delighted, of course, that uh, uh, in 18 and 19, we didn't have to acidify these Oregon wines and that uh, we, we can make um, almost uh, pure Pinots, you know, with no, uh, with no uh, uh, addition. And uh, in terms of irrigation, um, no, there is no irrigation in, uh, in Oregon uh, either. Um, uh, We're seeing, seeing a very, very dry season in, uh, in 21. So this is a challenge, but what I'm seeing from the reports, the photos that are sent to me, vineyards are not suffering uh, at the moment from the drought. Uh, everything is still very green, um, so it's, uh, they're not suffering. The, the, the challenge uh, in terms of irrigation is to establish a new vineyard. That is a challenge that's much more difficult than in Burgundy and with no irrigation it's really challenging to uh, install a, a, a baby vines. Um, but the soils are quite deep in Oregon, poor but deep. So, you know, you still have at, at, at 50 centimeters uh, at the beginning of the season, one meter uh, in, in, in July, uh, 1.5 meters, you still have some moisture and uh, normally it's not uh, necessary to irrigate. Maybe in the future we'll see, but it, normally it's not necessary. And in Burgundy, you are in anywhere in France, you are allowed to irrigate while establishing your vines. Yes. Only as soon as they join the Appalachian system that you have to stop. Even that's being discussed at the moment. So. Yes. Yes. Um, 
On Thank peut you parler much. français parce oui. que c'est bourguignon. Voilà. <laughs> we'll, we'll stay in English, but uh, now we're going to move to French wines. The first one, I'm not sure if it's marked as such on your sheets. Um, we just have it down as Maurice Saint-Denis. But just to point out that this is part of the uh, négociant operation of um, Meo Camusée Frère et Sœur, because you're associated with your two sisters. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so this is fruit that I purchased. Uh, it's been uh, the same um, same wine, uh, same grapes for uh, the last uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, two plots uh, uh, in uh, Maurice and Lee in at the foot of the village near the Route Nationale. Uh, early ripening and normally early drinking. Something that's worth um, saying also is that 2016, you will, uh, Amy mentioned it in the introduction, and I think you're probably all familiar anyway. It was the, the first year of big frost, first modern year of big frosts, uh, and it affected all up and down Côte de Beaune and Côte de Nuit, apart from one village, which is Maurice Saint Denis, which had a slightly bigger yield than normal. Uh, I don't know what they'd done, uh, which god they had prayed to, but uh, but they pretty much entirely escaped it. Um, we started, um, before we even tasted the Oregon wines, we had a little taste of the vest, and I really enjoyed the the sort of sense of it's light on its feet, it's accessible. I'd be pretty happy to start drinking that now. Yes, yes, I, I, I think so. I think this is a, a wine which has always shown quite approachable. So yes, 16, you have a good, um, a good, uh, very good uh, resume, a good uh, short notice about uh, the vintage. It was a uh, difficult vintage starting with a big frost and then a little bit like this year, uh, uh, beginning of the season that was very wet, very difficult, very humid, extremely challenging with uh, lots of uh, mildew and odium. And uh, at some point in June, we, I was, wondering whether we were not going to lose the battle really because it was unstoppable uh fortunately uh, uh sun came back uh, end of june beginning of july and uh, the summer the rest of the summer was dry and um, um offered us uh, a, a respite um this is mostly um you know, that doesn't really affect the quality of, uh, of the wines and the vintage, but it's really a, a, a battle to save the crop. And um, I remember it was really difficult, one of the most difficult years we've, uh, we've experienced. And fortunately, it stopped uh, in July, because otherwise, uh, I, I think we would have had a lot of damage. Were you able to stay organic throughout? No, 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 it's, um, it, we weren't, we weren't, uh, we had to, uh, and that was one of the lessons of that vintage that is now we're more prudent with the, uh, um, with the critical time, which is, uh, which is uh, between the flower, before and just after. This is where the vineyards and the grapes are the most vulnerable. And um, they were, I, I I don't want to comment on uh, and, and criticize my other uh, my other colleagues. They were uh, it was tough. It was tough to stay organic. I thought some succeeded. Um, it was um, some did yes, but it was tough. And as I mean, as years go past, uh, I think this is uh, an approach that we've been. Um, that we've been doing, uh, trying to uh, to be a bit less uh, uh, strict on that point uh, uh, around flowering. Um, I was reflecting because we have uh, the same problem in 21. I was reflecting that was also good for uh, the uh, peace of mind of uh, the owners and the viticulturists, and that is important also to uh, uh, preserve the health of. <laughs> <laughs> of ourselves and, and and the people in charge of uh, of spraying, it's uh, I don't want to uh, have uh, myself a nervous breakdown or a nervous breakdown uh, uh, in the staff. Absolutely, no sensible, pragmatic approach. I've just been down in the Beaujolais the last two days, and they've had even more water than mm -hmm. here, and they are just absolutely dead on their feet. Um, so far, they've managed to save their crop, but. 
it's taking a, a, a human toll, if you like. Mm. So you've got the Mori Saint-Denis, uh, I think that's the one wine you've got. Um, anybody care to comment back to us on this wine? Uh, we also have the Shoms in front of us. Yes, uh, right. we'll move. We'll move to the Shom and the rest of uh, the rest of the wines. But okay. maybe, maybe just one. Um, I think we've we've tried recently a number of 16s and 15s, and it's. I think we've generally found the 16s extremely enjoyable, uh, and maybe even open for business to taste now. Do you agree with that, or how do you see? these two strong vintages side by side with each other, especially on the reds. Well, while Jean-Nicolas is opening, uh, opening the sample of the Vern Schoem, I'll give a quick answer and then he can answer more fully. Um, the amazing thing about 16, it was actually really difficult to sell initially, particularly the wines, the Ospies de Bone, because they get sold earlier, because everybody had been crying disaster, catastrophe, uh, because of the frost. Uh, and then, uh, and it wasn't even evident, even though the second half of the summer, even though the weather was better, it looked as though everything was going to be a little bit strung out, the grapes were ripening at different speeds. But suddenly it all came together, just in the week or so before harvest. Uh, and the wines looked not too bad at all in the Cuvery, and the following year um, they started showing really well. And we've been talking about acidity quite a lot, and that was one of the features of 16, more than 15 was the, the joy of the acidity in these wines. And there's a real feel of concentration. Um, I'm not so happy with the 16 whites, but I have really liked the 16 reds. I think they'll still need a little bit longer, really, for everything to come together and for you to get the, the full enjoyment. But they're not closed down at the moment. Um, 15s I'd actually stopped tasting uh, recently because they were um, closing down or closed down. Um, so, but maybe Jean Nicolas, um, you served me the Schoen there. Yes, and this Schoen, is, and this is the uh, issue. Issue, okay. Um, but 15 is it's a gorgeous vintage. It's um, my very glib way of explaining it was it has the concentration of 2005 and the charm of 2010, and 5 plus 10 equals 15. But, well, I, I, I would have a slightly uh, different approach, but uh, coming to the same conclusion, actually, um, the, um, um, for me, the great vintage of the past um, uh, 10, 15 years is 2015. I, I, I love this vintage. And um, I, was a, I was a bit taken aback by some comments about uh, 15 being overripe and 16 not being overripe, whereas it's, it's the reverse with us. 15 has a, a, a great balance in terms of uh, the uh, uh, analysis, where 16, although it's a late September uh, harvest, 16 is higher, slightly higher in alcohol and lower in acidity. Um, so uh, it's well described in the, the vintage description. Yes, a very dry summer, some, uh, some rainfall, significant rainfall to ease a little bit the vines uh, uh, first half or around the 15th of uh, September. Significant rainfall and then we felt the weather needed, uh, the, the vines needed to absorb that, uh, uh, that and eliminate that uh, 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 that water. But the weather resumed uh, with great weather in late September, really 25 degrees, 25, 26 degrees, which is quite warm for late September. And it was really a great two week period where it was warm and, and sunny. And as a result, really uh, sugars went up very quickly. The concentration after uh, the rainfall happened quite quickly. And uh, this um, explained why we were a little surprised with the uh, uh, with the sugar and alcohol levels in 16. So I started with 16, liking 16 less than 50 because it, we, we, we didn't uh, have the same uh, um, good conditions and, and perfect kind of analysis in 16 compared to, uh, to uh, 50. Um, but I must admit that a um, you know, wine is not uh, totally uh, uh, 
uh, to be summed up and shortened with uh, with uh, with, uh, with the uh, analysis and vintage description. The, the wines have a character uh, of their own. They're light on their feet, and they they, they really have a charm, which is which is really the, 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 the which makes the success and the particularity of this uh, of this vintage. It, it is really a, 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 a vintage that has turned extremely well in that uh, in that respect. I still think that 15 is potentially the great vintage, um, and uh, yes, it's probably more uh, less approachable than 16. But I love the the the, the, the general uh, balance and the charm and the appeal of that um, of that vintage, and I think it has really turned out to be very nice uh, and and not uh, and not uh, sweet and over the top and a little bit heavy and a little bit tiring as I, I as I see it it's a great it's a it's really fallen on its feet and it's great vintage in that respect a lot of depth isn't there in that uh, von Romanet Le Chaux, one of the lower lying um, premier crews of um, uh, Von Romane, though still extremely well placed. Uh, it has a, a neighbor called Malconsor, some of you will doubtless be familiar with. And Latash. And Latash. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, if I, I if I can make a comment on on the show, it's a uh, it's a vineyard that was uh, there's a there's a, a part planted at the very beginning of the 60s, so it's now uh, reaching 60 years old. So it's uh, it's uh, becoming respectable, and uh, the other part, the most free force, is from the late 70s. And so obviously, this is uh, we've been in this. Um, time where the vineyard really changes um, quite um, quite a lot. Uh, it's really coming of age. And um, the uh, uh, this wine, which was uh, very easygoing, very, uh, very nice, is now becoming much more serious. And sometimes with a little bit of an issue uh, in the finish and uh, with a little bit of time. So uh, I think we still feel that today. Um, um, it, it actually, I think it actually adds to um, the vintage characteristics. I, I told you this was a very elegant, easygoing vintage, but um, uh, but this show is, uh, is is certainly showing well, but certainly also in in need of a few more years. Oh, for sure, yeah. The issues, though, I don't know if you have the same order uh, because I wanted to um, to save the uh, to save the brulee for uh, the uh, comparison with uh, Richbourg and Copantou. Uh, so Jean Nicolas, we are at the Clos Rougeau at the moment. Uh, yes, 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 and of course I forgot about Clos Rougeau. So let me uh, let me pour us. And it tastes wonderful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. But, sorry, just just curious. Back on the Shoms, uh, we have the map in front of us that Jasper kindly provided. Shoms looks like quite a large plot. Um, where is your holding within the Shoms? We are uh, close. We are uh, making the Nuit Saint Georges border of uh, Les Shoms. Uh, so that would be the main plot. We have 1.5 hectare, which is really at the south of uh, the Appellation, um, from uh, between uh, Malconsor, Boudou, and uh, Claude Réa. Really, this uh, south uh, corner, and I have a uh, half of a hectare in uh, on the Place de la Mairie. Uh, which would be a bit um, a bit further up north and um, going towards uh, more towards the village. But the the main plot, the roads go top to bottom. Yes. 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 Which I think is true for most yes. producers. So you have Clovisio after Shome or alongside Shome? You have the Clovisio with the Shome at the moment. Okay. Perfect. So this is a vineyard where you have a very substantial holding from the Kala. Absolutely, we have uh, three hectares um, 
at the foot of the castle. If you go to Clovougeau, if you've been to Clovougeau, you uh, have uh, come across our, uh, our, our vineyards. This is um, tied to uh, the history of the family because Etienne Camusé bought the castle in 1921 um, together with, uh, with the vineyard. And it seemed logical to, um, uh, to buy the vineyard next to the castle. Actually, 20 hectares were for sale at that moment. And Etienne Camusé made uh, a lot of uh, many domains in Bonormani by a piece of uh, Clos Bourgeois. And when you think of it, um, Bonormani has a big, big, big uh, influence and uh, is very well represented in the Clos Bourgeois. That comes from that uh, era. And uh, when you think of it, uh, uh, they are all, uh, most of uh, these uh, uh, Romani owners are located uh, 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 in that part. Um, so nobody wanted the castle. Uh, uh, Etienne uh, bought it and he never lived in it. And uh, this is why we ended up with this, uh, this plot. And this is a very special plot because in Clos Bourgeois you have many different uh, uh, terroirs, uh, many different uh, places. And of course, we, we talk about the top versus the bottom and so on. But even um, among the top uh, uh, third uh, tier of uh, the, 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 the castle there, you have very different uh, terroirs. And located next to the castle, the monks built the castle on the bedrock, which is only 80 centimeters down. Um, and so we really have the same terroir there with uh, uh, vineyards and uh, that are uh, really uh, fighting to get uh, under and to find a layer of, uh, um, of dirt between the rocks. And I think that gives us a, uh, a characteristic and a wine that is a bit perhaps um, lighter, although I would not qualify this wine as light but a bit uh, um, more um, lighter, elegant, and not as imposing as most uh, Clos Bougeau, or this is at least the image of uh, that uh, Grand Cru, a uh, big imposing Grand Cru. And um, I would not describe our wine like this. I think it has a lot of finesse, a lot of elegance, sometimes slightly severe, but uh, uh, not in any uh, sense uh, a big, uh, uh, imposing wine or more in, um, to uh, refinement. The moment, I think it's a wine that it starts in one direction, which is about the elegance and a, and a, and a softness of, uh, mm. uh, <coughs> of fruit. Um, uh, it's pretty concentrated on the palate though, and then the tannins kick in at this early stage of its, mm. uh, of its life. But we are all of us here in Burgundy fond of saying that you can't really taste Clos Bougeau until it's 10 years old, not because it's completely opaque or, or, or with too aggressive a structure. It just, it takes 10 years before the feeling of a personality really to come out. Um, so this is, this is a wine uh, that is going to require patience. Yes, I would, I would add to that, that, you know, following my comments on the fine, uh, on the fact that I find this wine to have uh, uh, elegance, and this is due to uh, the fact that in the cellar, before we bottle, our Clos Bougeot is often uh, one of the most enjoyable wine to taste. We, we love it, it's, it's open, it's, it's showing, uh, whereas some uh, other wines and some other Grand Cru are uh, much, uh, much more close. So I guess that this is a wine which is quite approachable when it's young. And then what generally happens is that it closes down and it becomes less interesting. I think that even given the fact that uh, um, 16 is a very approachable and easy growing vintage, we're seeing a little bit of this uh, today and we're seeing a, a, a wine and I've, uh, I've had uh, a couple of times this wine since, um, since we bottled it, uh, uh, what three years ago, and I've, I've said, well, it's really enjoying, enjoying. And today I can see that it, it's becoming a little bit less rewarding. And in my experience, yes, the Clos Bougeot uh, kind of shuts uh, shuts down, and it needs to uh, to be left on its own uh, uh, for uh, for a few years. And yes, uh, come back uh, to to that wine. 
in, uh, in, in uh, after 10 years of, uh, of age. So we might see the beginning of this, and it may be also relative because 16 is not really a, a, a vintage, um, or perhaps not a vintage that is uh, that I see really prone to close down and shut down really completely and be unapproachable for, 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 for a number of years. I don't necessarily see the vintage like this, but in relative terms, uh, yes, it may be a, a, a moment uh, where you may see a moment when uh, uh, this is happening. Hmm. Sorry, one question, please. You've got one, uh, we have the benefit of Jasper's wonderful map. Um, you've got one amazing plot of Clos Vougeau on the top right of the page. I guess this is what, north north side of the Clos Vougeau. And then you have a few small tiny rows that are on the south southwest. Oh, okay. yeah. this and I guess... Why I can yeah, this is why I can tell you that the terroir is very different within the Clos Vougeau, because having this small piece of Grand Maupertuis that we generally try to make separately um, is, 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 is a very good um, indication of um, two different um, types of wine within the same appellation. Uh, the big piece is, you know, um, obviously dominant into the blend uh, because this wine does include the small piece in the, in the Grand Maupertuis, but the big piece is um, refined, elegant, not imposing, and, and uh, perhaps slightly severe, showing a, a kind of severity uh, at some point. Whereas the Grand Maupertuis is generally a bit more uh, generous, a bit bigger in, in the mouth. Uh, you have uh, their uh, um, deep soil, 1.5 meters of, of soil, no problem. Uh, so bigger wine, very, um, very seductive, very uh, velvety, a bit less precise in, in the finish, I find. Um, but um, I've uh, bottled the two separately in two instance, instances in 2009 and 2017. So if you're interested in the differences, and this is really interesting because, you know, it's vineyards not exactly of the same age, but vineyards done by the same team and vinified separately in the same way by the same team. So the result is, is, is notably different and very interesting to, uh, to taste. So if you have the opportunity, I'm sure there's still a few uh, 17s on the market to, uh, if you're interested in tasting the terroir differences in, in Clos Bougeot, go for it. My guess is that before the end of uh, this evening session, possibly within the next three minutes, Michael will have bought some. <laughs> Quick question, um, Jean-Nicolas. You were saying earlier your 2016, to you, unlike the critics, it's riper than the 2015. Does it mean in terms of long-term drinking, it's going to be more medium-term sort of aging potential and drinking compared to, say, your 2015 or your 2010? Possibly, possibly. Um, I, I would phrase it a bit differently. I think that 15 is, you're still, we'll still be talking about 15 in 30 or 40 years, um, uh, if we're there. <laughs> Uh, 16, we, we, we may still talk about 16 in 30 or 40 years. I'm, you know, I, I'm not so sure about that, whereas I'm sure about it in, uh, for 15. But um, uh, yes, so far, uh, I think 16 has, has, shown, uh, has shown great drinkability. Doesn't mean it won't age. Um, and um, what I can say is that I'm very confident about 16. I, I, I think it's, it's a vintage that has uh, taken the right uh, path and the right track. And, and as I said, I was really very pleasantly um, surprised uh, with the 16. Not that I really had a bad experience with 16. It's not what I mean. What I mean is that I was so overwhelmed with 15 that it's always difficult for a vintage to follow a great vintage like 15. Um, 
so it's 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 why I I say that. But sixteen is, is certainly a, a very good or even great vintage. Yeah. I would agree with that general assessment that fifteen is unquestionably there for the long haul, and sixteen is a really beautiful um, vintage which uh, I would characterize as more medium term, but with the possibility of uh, stretching out later on. And I actually feel probably against the run of most critics, I feel a little bit the same way between 09 and 10, that I think that 09 is the 50 year wine and 10 is just so lovely already um, and more enjoyable now by some way than 09. But well, you will discover this evening, I believe, uh, how well 2010 is doing. Um, but I think that 09 probably, except for the people who got the picking dates wrong, will probably be the really long haul genius. But 50, 15, I think, is, is absolutely, it's great. Uh, absolutely tied on for, for being one of the greats. I would agree with the, with the 09 and 10 too. Um, I would agree with this, yes. I think in, in some ways it's, uh, not unlike uh, uh, 15 and 16, the difference is that 10 was, was high in acidity, which is not the case of uh, 16, but still, I mean, you find some acidity in these wines. So that's, that's, you know, that's the beauty of Burgundy is that even with relatively low acidity, they, they, there is some vibrancy, there is some, uh, uh, you know, real clear and, and, and dynamic uh, uh, aromas. So it's, um, it's a right vintage that is turning to be elegant and, and not heavy. And I think we should really be grateful for that. Eshizo, do you have that pool it's coming around? Uh, we have it here and I love it. Mm -hmm. Where are you in the Eshizo? A bit back. Is it the Rouge du Bar? Yes. So has everybody now got the issues over? Maybe? Good. Yes, we do. Excellent. As well as the brulee. I think, I mean, for, for me, the excitement will be to look at brulee alongside Pro Parentu. Um, so maybe concentrate on the Eshazo first. Um, you okay with that? And have sure, sure, and sure. Go through Absolutely. Together. Jasper, that was your comment a while back, and that's the reason why tonight's Paulet is centered around Brûlé, Crow Pound too, <laughs> and we couldn't help ourselves but slip in the Richbourg as well. I know, I know. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to do it. One thing that's missing from tonight, which, um, um, that's, well, actually two things. Um, because Jean-Nicolas uh, also has some brilliant Louis Saint-Georges vineyards. Um, and originally, uh, people in uh, Bon Romane would serve their Louis Saint-Georges before the Bon Romane, charge the same price for them. But increasingly, we're now finding it's almost better to serve the Louis Saint-Georges, maybe not after the very top Bon Romane, but a little further back in the proceedings, because they justify it. Um, and the other one, of course, is your Corpon, especially the yes. Ronnier, yes. gorgeous one. Now we have, um, uh, of course, we're, uh, we're better known for, uh, for Bon Romani wines and Cabrillo because of the chunk of uh, our, our piece there uh, and the history. Uh, but it's, um, it's true, I wanted to, um, uh, to tell you that um, I, uh, Naturally, love the the, the Nuit Saint Georges and and the Carton, and they. Uh, I always uh, try to uh, to to put on a uh, Nuit Saint Georges in, in such a in such a tasting. But of course, I perfectly understand, given the poly after that and the focus on uh, on the three stars of the domain, that uh, we, we we do focus on for many. But yes, uh, um, our two Nuit Saint Georges are really. Uh, Great wines that I love, um, the Nuit Merger and the Boudot. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, back in the 70s, uh, Nuit Saint Georges had a greater reputation than uh, than Bonomini. 
and uh, uh, we were all, uh, I, I shared this with uh, Etienne Cabot, we were, uh, you know, so proud, our fathers were so proud of having some Louis Boudot, which was, of course, big from Bon Romani, we said this was uh, the best in Saint-Georges, uh, and, mm. uh, 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 and the Boudot was really, uh, just after the uh, the Grand Cru, actually, the Boudot was the start of, 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 the, of the sellers there. Um, but just to say that um, I really, uh, being very close to uh, Louis Saint Georges and drinking uh, regularly my colleagues' wines, I really enjoy what they're doing, and I think it's a great village. It's uh, perhaps a um, little less in favor right now, um, and uh, but not really, uh, not really rightly so. Um, I prefer New Saint Georges to Gevray. I make a big bold statement. Yes. I, I, I prefer New Saint Georges to Gevray. In, in, in terms of character of the wines, in terms of quality, I think uh, it's more consistent in New Saint Georges. But then let's close the parenthesis and talk about uh, the Echezo. Mm. So, which Liadi uh, you in in Echezo? So, Rouge du Bas which is, um, um, which could be translated reds from down, <laughs> reds so down, the downside of reds. There is a premier cru in Grand Romanée called Les Rouges. And Les Rouges, um, <coughs> talking of Griveaux, uh, it's uh, mostly belonging to Griveaux, and Les Rouges is, is just at um, the top of the hill, just uh, below the, the forest. So this is premier cru because it's really a bit too high on the hill to be grand cru. And uh, Les Rouges du Bas is classified as uh, a chiseau. So as its name does not indicate, it's really on top of the appellation chiseau. And showing this by a uh, very high acidity, good acidity, um, and uh, therefore a very lively wine, uh, a, a wine with a lot of extraction, because of also this acidity, it's a ripe vineyard too. So we, we combine them both and um, it's very seductive, um, um, a bit big sometimes and in need of, uh, of aging to uh, reach a point where it's going to be really pretty. But, um, but it is already in, in 16 with this uh, level of acidity and this liveliness in the nose and in the palate. And it's a uh, it's a great wine. It's um, it should age too. I, I like it when it's uh, minimum 10, 12 years old. And uh, we've been having this vineyard since uh, '97, and I can say this is one of the last wines to to taste in a given vintage of ours. What struck me was the sense of precision in that wine. Um, a little bit the color, but certainly the very first bouquet. And that continues on the palate. Um, Jean Nicolas says the acidity is clearly there, but I find it very well harnessed you know, in the wine. So um, I think it's too young as well, but um, nonetheless, uh, there's an immediate uh, class to showing that wine, which I cottoned on to from the start. Any thoughts from the table before we start looking at uh, the brûlé and the Croix Parentou? Everyone is very excited, Jasper. Yeah. So, Jean Nicolas, this is a bit of a, a disco of mine, which we have actually had together while we're tasting in the cellar, uh, but also my friends in Hong Kong are aware of. And I said for the longest time that if you gave me the choice of either, I was going to take Brune mm -hmm. over Cro Parenteau. Mm -hmm. And it was just maybe the 2018 vintage when that was things were really well. Uh, yeah. And uh, that maybe, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. the order is changing. Um, I've, I've always really loved Brune as one of the crews of uh, Von Romanet. Of course, it's not homogenous because you've got a road going down the middle, you've got some slightly north facing, some uh, slightly south facing. Some are uh, on flatter ground, some more on a slope. Uh, it's a unusual place insofar as that the form of the valley 
means it's a bit of a heat trap, but you also get the cold air which is coming down the, the combe de brule from higher up. So you, so you get a, a hot and cold aspect to it, um, which can be very exciting. A lot of the best red wines in the world are made where you do get good temperature variations. Um, it tends to keep the acidity going even while the, the sugar is rising. Um, Yes, it's, I, I would, uh, I will give you a piece of advice here. If you can find a brûlé uh, from Henri Jaillet, buy it because it's a relative bargain. Uh, it's, uh, I, I was a bit disappointed. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, it reaches the price of Beaumont or it, or even it's not very much higher than, uh, than Nuit Merger, but uh, it should actually be closer to Coparantou and Richebourg in price. So it's really at 20,000 a bottle, it's, it's, it's really uh, much more of a bargain than a uh, Copa at 35. Are you talking in yen or, <laughs> or, or dollars or pounds or lira, <laughs> pesetas? Yes. Yeah. No, well, sadly, the, the, the time for buying only uh, very wines is over because yes. You, yes. you really, really, can't be very sure of provenance now. I think Jean Nicolas is, uh, was it an imperial bottle of Nuit Saint Georges Mer Merger 59? Uh, that's still probably the one of the most famous ones on Instagram. Now that was. Um... Was that from Very when you bought it? No, I don't think so. We, we, I, I, uh, uh, in November 19, we had our uh, anniversary and I served, uh, they're all frozen, but I served a Methuselah of Echezo 76. Mm -hmm. On Henri. That was bound to happen at some point. Yeah. Are you still with us, guys? That would still be okay. <laughs> Jasper, can you hear us? Oh. Oh, oh they're back. Yes. Oh, no. They're gone. Maybe. You went to go open the Methuselah, right? Yes. Methuselah of. Um, Echezo 76. That was uh, that was a gift of Henri to my uh, to my parents, and the handwritten label. But uh, yeah, the wine was good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can put the video again. Uh, if we yes, we have a connection. Yes. Yeah, we just lost you for a little bit. Mm. Right, I'm just going to take a minute or two to uh, taste these wines side by side, which I'm sure you're doing. You can walk on uh, Jean-Nicolas land all the way from um, Faucon to uh, through Richebourg onto Brude without having to tread on anybody else's vineyard. I call that quite smart. Yes. <laughs> the the Brule is wonderful. You're good. I'm certainly enjoying it. I mean, it's come out of the starting blocks more quickly of the two. Yes. That's for sure. The color is a little bit more youthful in, in our bottle at any, any rate. A little bit more of the purple still. And um, the Preparant II is, is absolutely not evolved, but it is nonetheless uh, developing on the color. But not yet on the nose. I'm having to go search for it on the nose. I think the Brulé was uh, 
a bit more closed on the nose uh, than the Copal 2. The Copal 2 is immediately uh, more uh, rewarding pressure and um, lots of fruit. Okay, I got them the other way around, but I'm sure I, I, I think uh, I got the glasses. I really, but um, the, the, the body is opening up to me. It's, um, I, I always feel the body is a bit more sturdy uh, uh, on, uh, on the nose. And the fact that, um, yes, uh, it seems to be a bit more, uh, the Copan too seems to be a bit more advanced. That's true. And the brill is catching up for me in terms of uh, nose. How's it going down in, uh, over in your part of the world between the two? Uh, does the team have a preferred wine or is it still a question of letting it develop in your glasses? Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. What, what do you prefer? Okay, so who prefers the brulee? And who prefers the crow pea? Okay, so the majority prefer the crow pound too, but there are some dissenting votes for the brulee. Dissenting votes. Well, like koala's votes count double. Yeah. We're just discussing here because it seems to both of us independently that our bottle of Crow Power 2 is fractionally short of optimal. It's not quite as you'd expected. I wouldn't have expected that little bit of extra evolution. It's not corked in the sense of TCA, but it's one of those wines where you feel that there is a slight deviation from the norm. Um, almost, so, almost, you know, it's difficult to pick up if you taste the wine independently, but I don't know if this is the comparison with the brulee, and maybe the ritual will tell us whether this is uh, you know, uh, we can have and feel a, 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 a small evolution in the, in the in that area. Maybe so. Maybe it's the comparison with the brulee, but there is a slight evolution to the wine, which is without bottle, which is you know slightly disappointing. I would say. So you guys have got a good one. I think it's a fantastic bottle. Unfortunately, this is the deficiency of Zoom. We cannot pass you a sample. <laughs> I'm sure if you pour some into your WhatsApp or WeChat, it will come down to the other end. It's, it's the future, Michael. It's the future. Indeed, the next, the next one, the next one. Um, <laughs> all I can say is that the Brulee is an absolutely stunning bottle of wine. Um, and uh, from what we have in front of us, uh, that's the one. But, but I, I do think we shall Nicola that it is not the um, preparatory is not quite as it should be. So, 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 Jasper, just curious, the mm -hmm. Brule, uh, the Richburg and the Copan to vineyards are all next to each other. Is Mayo Camusé's interest across the three contiguous or Yes, you can, walk on, you can walk through his rows of vines or alongside them. Uh, yeah. As you step out of Copan to, you step into his Richburg and as you step out of the Richburg, you can step into the Brule. Wow. Of, his, of his holdings. I have even done it without asking permission. <laughs> <laughs> cross with my, uh, come with my rifle. Yeah, I guess, exactly. I, of course, I don't have the rifle. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I do also feel that global warming has been a friend to uh, Crow Power on 2, uh, at least this, this rendition of it. 
because um, the plots are quite different between the two owners. Yes, we seem to have a, 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 a plot. Um, copal is always harvested uh, last. And um, as Jasper described, these um, three uh, vineyards are uh, next to each other. And this is very small. We can harvest that in, uh, in the morning. But I come to harvest Brulé first, then Richbourg, and Copal to last. So we would come three times to this uh, area and in a perfect order and, uh, and, 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 uh, and a perfect harvest, so to speak, there would be two day difference between each of these uh, vineyards. Sometimes it's mixed up because the ripening has not uh, been uh, uh, that different or there is a, a, a rain which is forecast and uh, therefore, uh, I think it's better to 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 pick Rejbo and Copan together, but generally this is the case, and that was the case in um, in sixteen. Uh, they are uh, they are uh, spread apart, and yes, Copan is very acidity is always a given in Copan um, and uh, um, and this is a great wine. I think it may have a margin of uh, of improvement still because of this acidity, because of uh, uh, the, the, the plants becoming finer as it um, uh, as it goes on. And uh, in the past few years, I've seen Coparon too. Maybe it's because it's very warm. I don't know, but I'm seeing since uh, 18, 17, 18, I'm seeing Coparon too, which is much softer, much nicer than uh, I'm I'm used to. Uh, there we have a version of Copan too, which is, you know, big uh, uh, structured wine with a lot of facility in need of, uh, of, of, of a long aging. Uh, naturally very dynamic, very fresh, uh, very, you know, uh, strong and, and, and showing. Um, but uh, in need of a lot of years to show a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of finesse and, and delicacy. And I'm seeing this change, maybe because of the very warm uh, vintages. I'm seeing, I'm seeing this change in, uh, in the past few years. Well, I'm still loving, loving the brulee. Uh, yes, it's true. Mm. So, <laughs> unfortunately, we couldn't help ourselves. The Richburg has already been served. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have got to get some dinner inside you too fairly soon. <laughs> and, and can we say it's uh, absolutely fantastic? Okay. Still spitting out at the moment, but I might not with the Rishbo. Hmm. So I don't think we provided the map of Rishbo, unless you do have that. We lost them. I don't think we do you have the map of the different owners of Richburg or not? No. No. Can you hear? We we just yeah. have the uh, Von Romany map. We don't have the okay. Richburg map. Okay, well, so uh, Richburg is sort of a, a southern half. There's a path that goes up through the middle. The southern half is just called Richburg, and uh, the northern half is called Le Varroil or Richbourg. And at the top of that, you have a little little bit belonging to Bichot. Then you have the main uh, Mayo Camusé uh, holding. So you also have a tiny bit in the on the Richbourg side. Uh, and then after that, you have um, the various members of the Grove family, all of whom are now swapping vineyards uh, amongst themselves, just to do with family inheritances, nothing more than that. 
And at the bottom of the Verwell side, you have a big plot belonging to Domaine de la Romani Conti, which they have completely ripped out. Uh, and they're going to plant it in the opposite direction. Um, so here we have the Richbourg, of which. Yeah. Jasper, do you need to turn on your video? What's that? Your video is switched off. Yes, yes, let me put it back. We were having a slightly unstable um, uh, connection, so uh, we took it down for a while. Um, I, I, we, thought, we thought you were opening a special bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, first time round, um, Jean-Nicolas was just going to open uh, the Riche Borg, and it turned out to be the Bourgogne Rouge. So, <laughs> so that's got put to one side. But if I'm very lucky, I might get some Bourgogne Rouge. <laughs> the Riche Bourgogne. Mm. Uh, isn't that a fabulous nose right from the start? Yeah. Um, gosh, Consensus it's sort of annoying in a way when everything goes according to the hierarchy. You'd almost rather sometimes that, that things did uh, jump out of order, but when you come to that line, there is no question, is there? Mm. Now, I had a first nose that was a bit that was slightly reduced, uh, but now it's really uh, showing and opening up, and a wonderful velvety impression on the mouth first and with this delicacy in the in the end and a very long finish. This is, yes, this is really a draw and I think it's showing well today. It's, it's um, I'm, I'm used to uh, having Rejbo a bit shy in its infancy, but it's really showing well. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I didn't expect to have quite that explosion of fruit, admittedly with that, that fractional reduction, but um, uh, by no means displeasing. Yes, it goes away relatively quickly, yeah. or we get used to it. I don't know. Sign of a great wine for me is when I just want to keep sniffing it, and I don't even feel like putting it in my mouth too quickly. It's so much pleasure to be had just from the bouquet. That is exactly what Sapel said. <laughs> Good man, Sapphire. Mm -hmm. Or are you teasing him? Mm -hmm. mm. I don't know what more to, to add, really, <laughs> because it's just a complete experience. Just to have this. It, 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 it feels like the Richbourg has that step up more in intensity. Than compared to the two premier crews that we've had side by side. Yes, it's 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 showing that way uh, today, um, and um, I think that Trichbourg really, when it's right, and it's 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 not a wine that. Uh, uh, really disappoint and there are no small vintages of Rivoire, that's not what I mean, but when the moment is right, when the wine is not shy, for me there is nothing above Rivoire. There's, there's, uh, there's, I've had some experiences of Rivoire, uh, um, one in Hong Kong actually, which was uh, very, uh, uh, very nice. I, uh, I was uh, in a big hotel with, uh, uh, with uh, and maybe you were, some of uh, you were there. And we had a wonderful menu and our, uh, our host, which I'm ashamed to say was not Watson, uh, but our host was, uh, uh, I had all the menu uh, right with the wines and so on. And we finished with the Nechezo 03. And with what we've said of the Nechezo, and you know the O3 vintage, the concentration of O3, the power of O3. Uh, I was very pleased with this uh, with this wine. But then our host brought a Richebourg O4, mm -hmm. and I said, "Oh boy, oh no, oh no! Uh, it's <laughs> never going to uh, to show anything after such a big wine and a big vintage in uh, in." Uh, in 03 and the sommelier really had put it last after this uh, this issues all because he was thinking the age before yes it should be last and he was right because even though 04 and the age was a much lighter wine 
than, than issues of it was kind of flying at 10,000 feet above because of its general character, the charm, the enticement of the wine, uh, the, the, the issues of was, was really great too, but the pleasure and the charm and, and the sense of completion of, of, of really having everything and the wine shining made a, a, a really a great impression. Um, so uh, this is why I'm saying that if when it's the right moment, when in the, when the wine is really singing, it's there's nothing about the ritual. Should we maybe use that as uh, a moment to take a look at the wines that you guys are going to be drinking over the next uh, hour or four, uh, and some thoughts from uh, <laughs> Nicola? <laughs> 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 Yeah, yes, any wisdom or comments would be much appreciated. Sure. So it's really a great lineup that you have here. And I, 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 I so much um, <laughs> would like to be with you. Um, but um, yes, it's going to be really, uh, really interesting. I see that you have a Rigo 15, so you're going to be able to compare it with the 16. And, and, and have an opinion and comments of your own about uh, the two vintages, uh, as we've discussed before. Um, I really, again, I really uh, think the 16 showed well. Uh, it's, I'm not yeah. finding any, any, trying to say, well, you know, it's a little bit like this, a little bit like that. No, no, it showed well, and it's, 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 it's very promising uh, wine even, uh, but it's really showed well. So 15 being a bit more concentrated, uh, uh, is it going to show that uh, openness, that charm, that liveliness, or just show that it's a bit uh, concentrated and just a bit shut down? You'll see for yourself. Um, then I, I, I go over baseball because this is uh, what we started with. Uh, 07 should certainly be the wine to, uh, to drink. And um, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned with 07 uh, showing how is it going to show with these in companionship with these great vintages 15 and 05. Uh, perhaps it's going to show very well because it will be the most drinkable you'll see. But uh, uh, maybe, maybe partner the eleven and the seven. Yes, yes, good. yes. We'll we'll see that. But anyway, I think that fifteen and 05 side by side is going to really be interesting also because it's very similar vintages. There's a bit more ripeness in fifteen than 05. But uh, last time I tasted 05 was. Uh, Facebook 05 was 18 months ago, and that was still very tight. Uh, and in my opinion, not ready to drink. But uh, you will see for, for yourself. Um, 11 in general is uh, a vintage to, um, to begin with. I, I, I think 11 is good. I, um, I had uh, the... Um, uh, Cro Parentou 11 not, uh, not very long ago, which I found a little um, tight and not ready to drink. Uh, I, I was, um, I, I, I tasted, uh, um, that is, uh, that, that was a, a kind of uh, by chance, because don't believe that I'm drinking Cro Parentou and Richbourg every day or even every week, but I had a uh, 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 a Corbin to 12 at the beginning of last week and an 11 this weekend. And the 12 was, was more enjoyable, more, more ready to drink, more friendly. The 11 was still, was, it was big wine, was showing a lot of food, showing a lot of, uh, of, of youth, but uh, a bit tight uh, in the end. So, um, 11 is generally a vintage I recommend to drink, start drinking now with Richebourg and Cropin too. I'm not so sure. Maybe these wines, uh, you know, they are a little bit big and a little bit tight to, um, to, to, to be ready to drink now. But I would uh, have, um, I guess, no problems with the Premier Cru, with even the, the Clos Bougeot, uh, with the Corton, both Corton, um, maybe the Ronnie, not so sure, but. Uh, the, the, the Carton Perrier for sure, um, and, 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 and these wines are 
you know, again, it's not because you, I'm saying you, know, you can drink them, that you should drink them, they can, they can age, but they were approachable. Uh, the Copain 211, I was, uh, we drank the bottle with no problem last weekend, um, but felt that it was a little bit uh, of a shame, which uh, was not the case with the 12 that went, uh, uh, that, uh, that went, <laughs> just went with, uh, without a problem and without uh, any uh, other comment rather than it's delicious. Um, what is so? Uh, and, uh, we still have O one and eighty eight. So O one was a. Um, I think it should be ready. Um, o one is uh, uh, one of the coldest vintages we've had in the last twenty years, um, and uh, um, relatively low uh, sugar and high in acidity. I was reassured with O one relatively early on. I remember this was a vintage. Um, I had, um, I actually had an Englishman that was an interview, Jasper, and uh, had an Englishman who was very polite and and tasted yeah, the definitely one. Definitely not me then. <laughs> <laughs> tasted the one uh, uh, early on and was very polite and mm -mm, yes. And then a few years later told me, I think that was the worst uh, experience with you because he tasted that before. At the very beginning of uh, aging, uh, the wine was still in barrel. It was um, maybe three or six months after harvest, and it was very acidic. Maloleptics took a long time to, uh, to, uh, to, to be completed, and it was very acidic, very harsh. Uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, when you have that uh, uh, impression of biting into a lemon, and that was a bit uh, a while. But we saw after these, uh, this episode, this malolactic, that the wines would take time, but would go there, would, would reach uh, their destination. So interesting to see whether this is the case or not. And uh, naturally, 88. 88 is um, an extremely interesting wine um, because this is the last. Uh, uh, I've just had a message from a spy who says, you're going to be in for a treat tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a, uh, the last vintage from Henri Um When we, um, when uh, Henri went into retirement, it was already agreed that uh, we would take uh, the vineyards over. And actually, uh, Henri, uh, Henri's tenure was, 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 was to end just before harvest. And uh, that was a bit, was you know the chances of a contract done 30 years before and uh, but, but I was still in school at that point and my father asked Henri to uh, to actually uh, harvest and do the, the vinification of the vintage and uh, so that is the last um, last vintage where we uh, that he did, that, that he uh, that he had um, that he vinified and I was, uh, I arrived early age nine, I found these, uh, these 88, and I, I cared for the Ilva and Botley. But um, yes, obviously a, a vintage uh, which was uh, perhaps uh, not as, uh, a bit more difficult, not as great as it was first um, uh, hailed, uh, because that was a vintage so certainly vintage with very good stuff, very good structure, very good concentration. The issue was with, with tannins. Uh, this uh, was a vintage with a lot of tannins, lots of structure, really imposing tannins. And um, yes, the wines were very good from the start, in need of a lot of aging. I, I got so many questions in the 90s about the 88 vintage and people were disappointed and when is it going to open up and so on. I think it's only after 20 something years that these wines have become really enjoyable. It was a vintage that got much better notices in, amongst UK critics than American. Um, it was also the first vintage, and this is true in both Bordeaux and Burgundy, when people started talking about the grapes not being physiologically right. Because actually, they came through in sugar terms, they came through to 12.5 without a problem. And, and that was rare in those days. 
Uh, and normally you got to 12.5 and you thought, great, let's pick them. It's bound to be right. But uh, Agrera told me that the grapes didn't really want to come off the vine. And you've got these, it's not just there's a lot of tannins, but they were fractionally underripe tannins. Mm. And eventually all that plays out and it's no longer a problem. But um, it will be fascinating to see uh, whether your bottle is, uh, is completely singing tonight, but uh, Sebastian tells me it's, uh, mm. it's starting well. <laughs> so good, 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 yeah. good, good. Now, I, I, uh, uh, this, uh, these are wines that, um, I, I, I remember very yeah. well, and um, as I said, I didn't make them. And uh, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's always a vintage that I have uh, liked, uh, and uh, which I have had uh, faith in. And uh, but uh, obviously in need of uh, of a lot of uh, patience. I've always loved it as a vintage, mm -hmm. even while recognizing that it does have the slightly tougher structure than, for example, 89, but I've always been a big fan of 88. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And what was good was that I, um, uh, my first vintage that uh, I bought on was 87, because I, as I told you, I arrived in January uh, uh, 89 in, in time to bottle 87. And, um, I, I made a few experiences in 87 with the bottling and especially with fining, with uh, stopping to uh, the filtration, uh, which were, I found very conclusive and that was of course under uh, Arnie's advice and we could, uh, we could uh, replicate that in, uh, in 88. So that was, uh, that is a bottling which is uh, uh, at the time very close to um, what uh, Ari would have done himself. Well, you're going to have a wonderful evening, and I uh, look forward to hearing from you between the 2010 uh, Brulee and the 2010 Crow Pound 2, oh, how yes. that, that yes. little uh, uh, pairing comes out. Um, but we should probably leave you to uh, move on to round two of your evening's entertainment, unless anybody has a, a final question for Jean-Nicolas. Jean-Nicolas, just maybe one question that we've asked, um, that I think everyone is curious to ask. If there's a vineyard that you could farm or acquire or buy or be able to own as part of Domain Mayo Camase, which would it be? A vineyard that, uh, um, you, you mean- um, You don't have, you'd like to have. Yes, that I yes. own, are that, that many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which would be the top of the table and which would be no money is no object. All right. It would be difficult. I, I would have a, an agonizing time choosing between Carton Charlemagne and Musigny uh, because I, I, I uh, um, of course, I could say Morachet actually, but uh, it's let's be reasonable uh, here. <laughs> and uh, uh, no, I really love uh, the, the wines of uh, Carton in general, and I think uh, that. Um, uh, doing a little bit of uh, Carton Charlemagne of my own. I, you may be aware, I drew a little bit of it in uh, with the exchange of grapes, but having a little bit of Carton Charlemagne, I would really love to, uh, to do that. And of course, there is uh, the fact that this is uh, naturally white Chardonnay and, uh, and, and, and not Pinot, uh, but uh, to uh, uh, have a bit more regularity and, and be able to master the whole cycle of Carton Charlemagne. I would really love that. Um, and then, of course, Musigny, because it's, it's, it's really, uh, yeah, uh, what is next to Vaudrenay, what is the best village? It's, it's Chambord, it's, it's the most, uh, most charming. And of course, I recognize that uh, I have, uh, uh, you, you have Chambertin, you have all that, uh, Chambertin is uh, for sure a great wine. And but Musigny would be would be uh, would be my choice, and again it will really be uh, tough to choose between the two. Uh, perhaps the choice of reason would be Musigny because it's more rare than uh, than than Carton Charlemagne, and I'm not citing any uh, vineyard uh, uh, in uh, in Von Romane. Uh, of course, I would love to have uh, Romane Conti or even Romane Saint Vivant actually um, that would come. Uh, uh, 
it's uh, lower in my list, um, not because I don't um, think these are great vineyards, of course, and possibly the greatest vineyards, but this is Vonormane and, you know, I, I'm, I'm gifted with Vonormane. I, I have some Vonormane to, to work with, and it would be really great to have a, 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 a great piece of, uh, of uh, Chambol Musigny to work with. That. So you guys better buy him some Musigny. <laughs> if, if we find one, we know who to call. <laughs> great, 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 great. Just a question. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, Sorry, last question, last question, question from us. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just a quick question. Do you make any wine that you don't really... Kind we, of lost it. <laughs> we lost it. We lost it. Okay. Can you hear me now? No, no, no. I said, uh, is there any wines that you don't release but you make for your family or for yourself? Um, yeah. Um, actually, uh, I make. Uh, you you may be amused by this. I make a sparkling wine uh, for the family. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <be> crazy. <laughs> Forbidden anybody to uh, uh, sell this wine, even uh, under the table, as we say in French. And uh, I absolutely don't want to have uh, the New Museum in, in on the sparkling wine. Uh, but it's uh, um, I've been uh, doing this uh, uh, for the family on request. And my father, my grandfather made it, and for fun and for enjoyment. And uh, they ha all have uh, memories of that wine. And I've uh, I've done that recently, and it's actually really quite well. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased, and you know, with family, it's not uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the 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 important things that matter. It's the uh, you know, uh, it's the bickering offers with uh, with small spoons, as we say in, in <laughs> French. And I'm so relieved that they like the sparkling. <laughs> That it's it's really uh, it really helps me. Uh, aside from that, there are a couple of wines which are made in so small quantities that the distribution is very limited, either uh, limited to France or to a few customers, selected customers, or even one customer. Yes, that can happen given the uh, small quantities that we harvest. <laughs>